the recording button here. Um, OK, uh, thank you again for the great talk, um, even though I haven't been able to catch most of it because I've been running around behind the scenes. But um, uh, very much interested in Dbus and Emacs. I'm very much looking forward to watching it after the conference. But for folks who were uh, able to and um, did catch the talk, uh, please, now it's time to uh, send in your questions. Uh, you can either ask away on IRC or put them on the pad. And we'll also open up this PBB room um, in a little bit if you'd like to join here directly and ask you your questions. So, Ian, please take it away. Hey, thanks. Yeah, uh, going to wait for some questions to come in, but there's a couple points I wanted to make. So I'm going to share my screen here for a minute. Uh, if you're interested in exploring more about Dbus, there's a graphical client called dfeet. That's d-feet. Uh, I guess puns are strong when it comes to Dbus software. And this just gives you a graphical overview of what's going on with your bus. So in the case that I was looking at uh, in Emacs, you can uh, look, here's the host name one service, and here's... Uh, you know, like you can change the chassis of it or read um, on a desktop here. So I think this is a, a really great tool for just understanding what is available and what Dbus can do. Um, I think I didn't do a great job of setting out a vision. So I want to try to reiterate that here. Ever since I started using XWOM several years ago and before that, even once I was learning about Lisp machines, one of the things that I really want out of my computing experience is a full Lisp environment, like a modern Lisp machine. And I think uh, Emacs and XWIM are the closest thing to that that you can get on a modern machine. But if you're thinking about what are the gaps between that and a full-blown desktop environment, there is many of them that make it inconvenient in a variety of different ways. And my vision is really to have an Emacs desktop environment. And I think Dbus is really key to making that work. And I would love, you know, uh, on the one to two year horizon, I would really like to see uh, common system tasks be able to get done seamlessly from inside of Emacs. And what I mean by that is things like pairing with a Bluetooth device, connecting to a Wi-Fi network, you know, rebooting your computer or putting it into suspend or, you know, any of those things that you might think of doing in a full blown desktop environment, whether it's Mac OS or Windows or GNOME or KDE or whatever, you should be able to do all that from Emacs. You should be able to manage everything without having to leave that environment because uh, I really prefer the Emacs environment. I would like to do all of that from inside Emacs. And when it comes to integrating with all those different things, Dbus is really key to making it work. Uh, but I do think <clears throat> that offering the ability of integrating Emacs into the desktop for people who don't want to go that route of having a full-blown Emacs desktop environment, I think that's also a, a path to some really interesting feature opportunity that has been difficult to explore uh, in Emacs in years past. So I really think it's just a, a great space to be exploring. And I'm really excited to see what kind of stuff I can build in there and what things other people start building in there. Sounds great. Yeah, and I think um, Dbus could, is kind of, I guess, one of those essential key pieces of um, software on GNU Linux where, um, I mean, if it's working and when it's working, it's pretty much, I mean, you don't even notice it. Um, it's behind the scenes. Everything seems to be working hand in hand. But yeah, like I remember, uh, for example, when I first switched to using a custom window manager, um, you pretty much lose all of that sort of integration and togetherness right away um, if there is no Dbus. So, um, and yeah, a lot of beginners like myself at the time, at least, um, don't even know what, you know what they're missing out on. So um, kudos for you know taking this on and uh, having this vision of essentially um, moving towards that direction of being able to use Emacs as a potentially fully featured desktop environment. I think that's awesome. Yeah, thank you. It uh, looks like I have some questions in the pad, so I will cover some of those. Uh, no, it's not Web3, not funny. Uh, this is, I'm sorry, the question was, so is this a Web3 approach? No, it isn't. Uh, 
I have another question. This, this is such a great overview of Dbus. I haven't been paying attention to this space because it seemed to be in flux 10 or 15 years ago. How long has Dbus been around and what was in place before that? So I covered this real briefly in the beginning of the talk, but Dbus dates from 2002-ish. Uh, and I would say since 2010, 2012, that time frame, it has been pretty stable and has seen wide adoption in multiple desktop environments. Before Dbus, there wasn't anything like it. It didn't replace a similar feature. And if you wanted to do the sorts of things that Dbus does, you were pretty limited. Um, those of you who have been around for a while might remember that a lot of GUI software for Linux in the 90s was some variant of a shell, like a graphical shell program that just called out to uh, an existing binary on the system, right? Like you might have a disk formatter and it lets you like has a drop down for the file and you know lists your devices and whatever, but it was doing all the work, right? All it was was the interface. All the work was happening by delegating it to a program. And essentially what that's doing is that's turning the text user interface, the command line user interface into an API, right? Because you're using a program to talk to it, but it's not really meant for that. And there's a lot of details in that interface that are not stable, right? Like anyone who's used a Mac after using a Linux machine has probably found, uh, been surprised that like the find command didn't work how they expected. And, you know, there's a lot of that. In order to make that stuff really reliable, you end up having to build a lot of special cases into it, but it, you're doing it at the wrong layer. And what Dbus does is it really lets you have a separate architecture where the service is what encapsulates all of the differences between, you know, kernels, distributions, flavors of tooling, and just abstracts all of that and gives you a proper API that you can use. And I think that's great because that lets you build these uh, high level interactive components at an abstract level where you don't necessarily need to care about the implementation details. I think that's really great. Um, so that's really what was happening there. And when it comes to, you know, two-way stuff, it was, you know, like a fancy version of Unix pipes. You know, you would um, run your program and maybe if you were lucky, it had some sort of machine readable output uh, switch you could turn on so that you could have a progress bar or something like that. Um, you know, that was the sort of thing, but there wasn't really anything exactly like Dbus. Uh, I have another question. Forgive me if this question is silly. Why is everything Dbus prefixed with org dot? Um, not everything is, but most things are. The those identifiers are reverse FQDN. So if you think about like Java namespaces, that's what they're ripping off there. And it's org because most of it is written by nonprofits. So in particular, Free Desktop is what it sponsors development of Dbus. And so there is uh, an inordinate number of org.freedesktop.whatever uh, services on Dbus just because they build so many of them. Uh, in your investigations, do most OS desktop environment window manager interop well over Dbus? Which ones have proven more challenging, if any? Um, I'm not sure I quite understand this question. Dbus is fairly abstract and, you know, those graphical programs can choose to use it or not. Um, but you're not interacting with the desktop environment too much. You're interacting with a service, right? So what you're doing is you're taking any program and you're breaking it into a client server model. The Dbus service does all of the work and then there's a graphical environment on top of it. So they're communicating back and forth. And if you want to do those same things, you want to communicate with the service, you don't need to communicate with the actual GUI program unless you want to control the program, right? If you want to do the same thing the program is doing, you can use a Dbus service. I guess in the case of something like a word processor, you might want to have a Dbus API that lets you, you know, add a heading or something like that. That's not an area I've explored too much. Um, so I'm not sure how that works or doesn't. Uh, regarding using XWIM as a desktop environment, does XWIM provide a session manager daemon? Uh, I would 
uh, whoever wrote that, if you could add some more context, I would appreciate it. I'm not sure I can answer that as it is written. Um, so I don't know. Uh, next question. There is a lot of criticism against Dbus out there. Why do you think that might be? Well, it's because it's not very good. <laughs> uh, like, I mean, I, I love what it unlocks feature-wise, but I do think it is not the best implementation for doing what it does. Uh, but you know, when in Rome, you know, you want to you want to do those things. I want to do those things. I don't want to rewrite everything in the way I think it should have been to get it done because I'll never get it done. The whole point is like you just shove it in a corner. You don't have to care about it, and you use high level bindings. I would say the specific criticisms I've seen are like using XML is something that is not popular these days. And uh, if I had to criticize a thing about it, I would say it's it doesn't have strong guidelines for how to make a good API. And so the quality of one service to another can be very, extremely variable. And different services have different ways of doing very similar tasks. So I would love to see, if anything, a little more uniformity in those APIs. Um, I generally could care less that it's sending XML around or whatever. Like, I, I think that's, I think people who are like offended that XML is being used uh, are, don't have their hearts in the right place, basically. Um, which system services come to mind when thinking about applications, be it at the OS desktop environment, window manager level? So the stuff that I am interested in using this for is like I was saying, you know, connecting to wireless networks, pairing with Bluetooth devices, that kind of stuff. Things that don't have a streamlined way of accomplishing it uh, without using Dbus and some graphical client. And I would just like to not have to deal with the client end of it. I just like would have, I would like the UI to be in Emacs. Um, when it comes to managing devices, how are Dbus and UDEV related? UDEV is a Dbus service. So it is a daemon that is running at some point in the background. If it's not running, Dbus will start it when you send it a message. And uh, you, it, oh, I'm sorry, I'm mistaking UDEV for UDISCs. UDEV is unrelated to Dbus. D UDEV is a, uh, a way of dynamically populating your devices and uh, having triggers that run when they are plugged in or unplugged. They're orthogonal. Uh, Dbus and UDEV don't interact. But Dbus, I, I suspect it. some of the Dbus services, like UDISCs too, probably need to talk to UDEV in order to do their job. But this is a service by service thing rather than uh, Dbus is integrated with UDEV sort of thing. Um, skip one of these. If you want to do the kinds of things that Dbus does, you're limited. What is something Dbus does that you couldn't do before? What is a really cool use of Dbus in a modern desktop environment? So again, I think that the hardware and dynamic refresh is the use case that I keep coming back to. You know, you walk somewhere where there's a new Wi-Fi network or there's an open Wi-Fi network to connect to, and maybe you get a notification somewhere. You plug in some hardware and it shows up in some list or some user interface to make it easy to use. Uh, you unplug it, it goes away. Those are the things that I think are really interesting because when you use a full-blown desktop environment, you come you have come to expect that kind of interactivity and that kind of integration from the low level of the hardware up to whatever graphical layer you're using. And uh, Emacs doesn't have that. And I want it to have that. So I think that's um, that's the, the thing that Dbus really gives me. I would say in particular, you know, you plug in hardware and it shows up in a list. That's pretty damn cool. Uh, that's a thing that I don't remember seeing done without Dbus. Or the way it was done was not portable and very complicated. Right, Dbus allows you to build those types of interfaces with a lot less work, and I think that's pretty great. 
uh, the deep, let's see, as an average GNU slash Linux user, I've used signals and methods before, but not properties. You gave an example involving properties, but it kind of flew by. Can you explain briefly what clients and services can do with properties? Sure. So um, let me share the screen real quick. So just looking at host name one, because this is a, a pretty simple and straightforward. Actually, let me look at uh, UDisks. So here's a whole mess of disks that are connected. And you can see, like, here's a block device. And it has all of these different properties to it. So like, hint system will say, uh, is this a system device, right? Is this a fixed device, something that the system is in control of mounting? Or is this something that a user might want to interact with? And that property is how you're going to know which one of those things are. And I think that's really important when you're building a UI. Maybe you want to hide the system disks because you know, you can see them, but there's not much you can do, right? Like I can't unmount my root device without turning the computer off. So the num the things you can, the things you might want to do at a graphical interactive level are pretty limited. And that property lets you figure that out. Uh, you know, here's a crypto vacuum device, it read only, what drive is it associated with? They really bundle up just a lot of metadata about the thing and they have a lot of links in between the different objects so you can looking at one thing you can you know connect it up to other parts of it at different levels right like there's the notion of a drive which contains a block device which can have some partition tables which can have file systems or maybe a, an encryption container that has more of those things so it's really a tree uh but it's kind of a strangely modeled tree where you have to walk the different leaves like it's not just it's not a single tree that encapsulates everything it is uh, a tree of links into other bits of the tree essentially so they're important to use for that sort of thing uh, the other thing that properties do is uh, the signals let you know when a property has been updated right so uh, like if your host name changes, you can get a signal that says, hey, my host name changed and maybe, maybe give a notice. Or if your active network connection changes or disconnects, a signal is going to be what tells you that. And the change in property is what will drive the signal. So it's kind of related to that. Uh, naive question, me not knowing much about Dbus. Is there such a thing as a Dbus reflection browser, maybe Emacs based, that lets you discover all the behavior different Dbus app participants provide? Uh, and actually, wait, I think you're showing it. Yeah, Dfeet is that. Um, definitely a to do item is to build an Emacs Lisp interface that is akin to Dfeet, but I have not done that. So, pull requests, welcome. Um, Question, Dbus seems great for extensibility, but then Emacs has no such mechanism and is fantastically more extensible. Why do you think this is so? Uh, I don't think I agree with the premise. Dbus is not really that extensible in the way that you might think in the same context as Emacs. You can add new functionality by adding a new service, but you can't add new functionality to an existing service without changing it. So I'm not sure I would say that's extensible in the same way, whereas Emacs is very you know, malleable and you can change how it works even while it's running. So I think it's a, a different kind of uh, extensibility, really. Uh, and uh, Emacs can participate on Dbus, so it, it is, you know, Emacs has a superset of what Dbus can do, really. Uh, do you have any other cool Dbus ideas? I think I have dropped them all. Definitely remote org capture is a thing that I have wanted a couple of times because, like, if I'm browsing around somewhere, I'd really love to have a a simple flow that allows me to turn a web page into an org capture. And I think Dbus could be a good way of accomplishing that, although I haven't messed with the browser integration end of it. Um, 
Are there buses besides system and session? Is there anything more to a bus besides a way to group objects? Uh, there are always at least a system bus and a session bus. And actually, that's maybe not completely true. There's always at least a system bus. Session bus, as long as there's at least one logged in session. Um, and it, there's really more than one session bus. There's one bus per session so that you're not leaking stuff across sessions on the same computer because uh, despite this being 2022, uh, Unix is still a multi-user operating system and you have to think about that stuff. Um, there, are, there are an unlimited number of uh, Dbus buses. You can create ones that have limited sets of services. You can connect to ones over a TCP socket. Um, there are, are always generally at least system and session there can additionally be other ones, but it is uncommon to have any other bus. Generally, well-behaved DBus services will attach to one or the other of those two buses. Uh, and in fact, Pulse Audio is, it has DBus support, but it is not a good DBus citizen because it does not use the session bus. It has, well, it, it, it's very weird actually. It has a DBus plugin that hooks into the session bus, but all it has is a method that returns the path to the Unix socket of the real D bus, which you then have to connect to separately, which strikes me as not the best way of, uh, of doing that. Cool. All right, I think that is all of the questions. Cool. I think we still have about like six and a half or seven more minutes um, of Q&A on the stream. So um, if there are any more questions, folks, please, uh, please feel free to post them on the pad or come up here, uh, join us on BBB. Um, yeah, we can hang out for, here for a little bit longer. Um, the stream will move on at, at some point, but um, Ian, of course, and anyone else who is interested is welcome to hang out if Ian is around. Um, yeah. Okay. I will be around for a bit. I, I am on IRC all the time but I'm not always paying attention to it. You're welcome to reach out to me there. Um, this is with almost all of my Emacs packages and stuff. This is in my Emacs weirdware project on Codeberg. So codeberg.org slash Emacs weirdware has everything that I demoed and uh, some other wonderful goodies that maybe you, maybe you already know about and maybe you don't. Uh, I saw one other question from the chat, which is, um, what do you use this for? Uh, well, <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, the main thing I use it for is uh, discomfort for managing external devices. Uh, but this has been a, a really great research project, you know, uh, just to understand Dbus better, see what it can uh offer and um you know write some interesting code because what i really like is writing writing code that unlocks new possibilities to where people can look at it and say oh that gives me a great idea i want to do this with it and i see dbase and uh, you know this talk as really just pushing mindshare on this stuff and I really, you know, the best result of this talk is for people to come out of it and say, wow, that was awesome. I can't wait to build something with it and go build new stuff. Uh, and just kind of building those platforms that other people can use and find helpful in whatever their programming journey is. That's the thing that I, I really like. That means a lot to me. So I hope that uh, someone watches this and comes away with a good idea and goes and hacks on it. Uh, looks like there's one more question. I'm not sure if we have, no, it's getting edited. I'm not sure if we have time. I'll follow up in the pad if uh, we end up over time on that. Yeah, we still have a couple more minutes, so it should be good.
Uh, okay, so the last question is, it looks like Dbus is mostly useful for Emacs to do IPC. If I understand correctly, this is how Syntex works when working with LaTeX docs. How does it compare with other ways of doing IPC, for example, communicating over a socket with MPD? Um, so the main way that it's different is that, you know, MPD has its own protocol that you have to uh, build support for in whatever your client is. You, uh, Dbus gives you a single uniform way of talking to any service. So instead of having to reinvent that socket code and write the protocol support for MPD or whatever else, where you're taking, you know, sort of the, the concrete, what are the bytes over the wire and building an abstract programming interface that wraps that and drives those things. Dbus already provides all of that. So you can say, here's a description of everything that I already do, and you can code gen stuff to do all of it. So I, I think that's the main difference uh, between them. But you know, it is over a socket. It is, it's over a Unix socket for local stuff, TCP for remote. Uh, it is very similar. The main difference is that it is a framework for multiple applications rather than an application specific mechanism, which makes it very easy to reuse in a variety of different contexts. And I think that's been key to its popularity over the last 10 years or so is the fact that it provides just enough opinion about how stuff should work that you don't have to think too hard about what should the protocol be? Should it be binary? Should it be text? Should it be S expressions? Should it be JSON? You know, it's already done for you and you can just think about how do I connect it up? Um, and I think that provides a lot of value. Yeah, and I can second that. Um... You know, it's been adopted by all sorts of different uh, software projects, um, one of which I worked on, um, Jammy, people might know, GNU package uh, for basically universal communication. It's basically a text messaging and also audio video calling and conferencing application. And, you know, it's Daemon, which runs in the background. It also supports Dbus, so you can write, you know, do all sorts of things, write little, little like Python scripts or whatever, um, talk with it through Dbus, um, give it commands to like take calls from a particular point. Um, or, you know, just hang up calls or just do all sorts of things over Dbus. So, and it is all, like you said, sort of application ag agnostic. It's not specific to, oh, how, how would I do this in a different way for each like individual application? Yeah, exactly. It's the de facto way of doing that sort of stuff on Linux machines these days. And, you know, you can look back to some of the other like, uh, message passing stuff in Windows and see it's drawn some inspiration from a variety of different places um, and, you know, different ways of doing that kind of interactivity. Uh, but it is, I mean, I don't think there was ever really a, a serious competitor to it, but it is the de facto standard if you want to do any kind of, um, you know, graphical program that manipulates your system or a batch program that inter that uh, drives an otherwise purely interactive graphical program. Like that's the tool and there is not really any competitive landscape or reason to go reinventing it at this time. Sounds good. And I think that's all the time that we have on the live stream, folks.